Hi, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Band Together Leadership Seminars. My name is Paul Everts. I'm the CEO and founder of Band Together. You can reach me at my email, and I wish you would, B-A-N-D, number two, together, band together, at comcast.net. Also, please look at our website, which is conductingmylife.com, where you can get my Conducting My Life book. It's a real book. Please contact me, and uh, I get you a book and mail you a book. Uh, go to Amazon.com not to buy the book. Don't do that. No, please don't, because they're in my garage. But um, you can see the uh, reviews. It's a real book, and I'm grateful for all the wonderful reviews we've had about the book. Also, go to the curriculum tab. You'll see I'm part of the John Maxwell team. I am certified right now to teach, train, speak, coach about seven different valuable resources. So here I am. I'm your man. Uh, it can be... Uh, one-on-one -on -one lessons, we can do groups, we can do whatever you'd like. Just contact me and we'd have a really great time. I'm recording this uh, from our beautiful home here in uh, Northeast of Sacramento, California on the 8th of June, Tuesday, around 10 o'clock in the morning. Um, I've seen some very disturbing things come up and I want to remind everybody why I do this. I do this because I was told um, not to talk about non-subject material. So I teach high school music, and I used to do life lessons. Uh, in fact, I would use John Maxwell, and principal uh, called me into her office. This would be the seven, 2017, 2017 um, October, and said, uh, are you using John Maxwell material? And I said, oh, absolutely. I've been using it since 1999. Um, I don't think that's appropriate for public schools. And I went, oh my goodness, are you kidding me? This is a New York Times bestselling. Well, he's a minister, a pastor, right? Yes, but this is secular. Um, have you read any of the books? No, I just had a complaint from a parent. Okay, um, would you like to come see me teach a lesson? I do these lessons at lunch, Miss Principal. No, I just, I think it should stop. It's not a place, you know, public schools, you just can't have John Maxwell. I've used John Maxwell since 1999. Um, my students have, and my, my children, my own children, PJ and Katie. I cannot thank him enough for what he has done for me and literally millions of people through his books, his uh, lectures. I don't know. So I, I say, wow. You're not going to read any of his books, and you're not going to come to a presentation I make at lunch, not during class, not during class, and yet I have to stop. Yes, if you don't stop using it, we're going to have to write a letter of you know, reprimand. And I said, wow, if that's the leadership I'm going to be working under, then I'm in trouble because uh, I tend to uh, speak my mind loving, lovingly in my heart, my heart, my heart. Um, but anyway, I only bring that up because I, I do these, YouTube, I have a podcast, I have a blog, uh, because I really believe what I give to the children, I give my own children, and our son is a lieutenant in the United States Navy, uh, he's an officer on a ship, our daughter is an office manager for a local physical therapist, two great kids, PJ is married, beautiful daughter-in-law, great, wonderful grandson so i think the material i give more times than not works thank god man i got students who are mothers wives fathers husbands uh firemen policemen uh i don't know doctors lawyers for me the passion is to teach life through music and that passion is being eroded because uh, my view on life is not matching in the narrative. So therefore, I can do this. Any kid that I teach can come on to one of those three things, podcast, YouTube, or blog, and see the other side of Mr. Everts. And I would have no problem talking to him at lunch, talking to him after school, before school, just not during class, because I was told not to do that. Now, the math teacher teaching social injustice, now that person... Man, you do all the social injustice you want with your math and your English, and yeah. Anyway, so there was a disgusting presentation at Yale University recently, and I 
We'll have it in the description of today's show so you can see it. And thank goodness, at least one part of the news sources are reporting it. I haven't seen it on CNN yet. Haven't seen it on MSNBC yet. ABC, CBS, or NBC. It could be now. It could, as of June 8th, it could be there. I don't know. I do know that it has been on those conservative stations. I do know that. So I was reading something yesterday. I'm reading the book in a Bible, or a Bible in a year. <laughs> Let's mix that up. And uh, we just happened to be on, on John chapter 17, verse 3. And I'm working on the Founder's Bible, which is a beautiful Bible. My goodness, here it is. It's gorgeous. Thank you, Diana. It's our 30th anniversary gift. And, and it mentions Yale University. God has amazing time. So I'm going to read this to you. Please don't turn it off. You know, please have the strength to listen to something and learn from it. So, America's first school of higher education was started in, I'm going to say, Henrico, Virginia, in 1620. But was wiped out by an Indian massacre two years later in 1622. The second, and the first to survive, was Harvard College chartered in 1636. Its rules set forth what was expected of every student seeking a higher degree at the premier institution. Here it is. Let every student be plainly instructed and earnestly pressed to consider well the main end of his life and studies is to know God and Jesus Christ, which is eternal life. That's John Chapter 17, verse 3. This is Harvard College, 1636. And therefore, to lay Christ in the bottom as the only foundation of all sound knowledge and learning, and seeing the Lord only giveth wisdom, let everyone seriously set himself by prayer in secret to seek it out of him. That would be Proverbs chapter 2, verse 3. Everyone shall so exercise himself in reading the scripture twice a day that he shall be ready to give such an account of his proficiency therein. Again, that's Harvard College, 1636. So John 17.3 formed the central education purpose for America's first college of higher learning. And Harvard's emphasis changed little over subsequent years. For example... A century and a half later, its 1790 rules similarly required the following. All persons of what degree soever residing at the college and all undergraduates shall constantly and seasonably attend the worship of God in the chapel morning and evening. All the scholars shall, at sunset in the evening preceding the Lord's day, lay aside all their diversions and it is enjoined, commanded, upon every scholar carefully to apply himself to the duties of religion on said day. So firmly was Harvard dedicated to this goal that its two mottos were, here's Harvard's two mottos, one, for the glory of Christ. That was one of Harvard's mottos. Don't tell anybody. Secret. And the other one, for Christ and the church. That's Harvard. I don't know if that's the same Harvard in 2021. Yet this emphasis was not unique to Harvard. It also characterized nearly every major American university formed over the next two and a half centuries. For example, in 1692, the College of William and Mary, founded in Williamsburg, Virginia, so that the following, the youth may be piously educated in good letters and manners, and the Christian faith may be propagated to the glory of Almighty God. A century later, William and Mary was still pursuing the goal, as indicated by its 1792 requirements. Here they are. The student shall attend prayers in chapel at the time appointed and there demean themselves with the decorum which the sacred duty of public worship requires. 
1699, here comes Yale. This is Yale, and boy, I hope you take a look at what their visiting lecturer said about the psychopathic white people. Oh my goodness, here we go. Yale, 1699. Founded in order to plant and under the divine blessing to propagate in this wilderness the blessed reformed Protestant religion. When classes began two years later in 1701, Yale required, this is Yale, the scriptures, morning and evening, are to be read by the students at the times of prayer in the school, studiously endeavoring in the education of said students to promote the power and purity of religion. In 1720, Yale charged its students the following, Seeing God is the giver of all wisdom, every scholar, besides private or secret prayer, wherein all we are bound to ask wisdom, shall be present morning and evening at public prayer in the hall at the accustomed hour. Then in 1743, and then again in 1755, Yale instructed students, again, this is Yale University, and now look at it now. Oh, my goodness gracious. Oh, above all, have an eye to the great end of all your studies, which is obtain the clearest conceptions of divine things and to lead you to a saving knowledge of God in his son, Jesus Christ. In, it's now 1787. This is still Yale. Check out who they invite to speak now at Yale. Rules likewise declare. Here's a Yale. All the scholars are required to live a religious and blameless life according to the rules of God's word, diligently reading the Holy Scriptures, the fountain of divine light and truth, and constantly attending all the duties of religion. All the scholars are obliged to attend divine worship in the college chapel on the Lord's Day and on days of fasting and thanksgiving appointed by public authority. That's Yale. Compare Yale to now. We're talking Ivy League schools right here. Hmm. In 1746, Princeton College was founded. As it began to grow and expand, the Reverend John Witherspoon, who later became a signer of the Declaration of Independence, that began John Witherspoon, became Princeton College's president, requiring of students that every student shall attend worship in this hall, college hall morning and evening and shall attend public worship on the Sabbath. There shall be assigned to each class certain exercises for their religious instruction, and no student belonging to any class shall neglect them. In 1754, Dartmouth College of New Hampshire was founded by the doc from the Reverend Elazar Wheelock as a school of higher education for Indians in the region. And its charter was very succinct as its purpose, and here it is. Whereas the Reverend Elazar Wheelock educated a number of the children of the Indians natives with a native with a view to very to carrying the gospel in their own language and spreading the knowledge of the great Redeemer among their savage tribes. And the design became reputable among the Indians in so much that a large number desired the education of their child, children in said school. Therefore, Dartmouth College is established for the education and instruction of youths in reading, writing, and all parts of learning which shall appear necessary and expedient for civilizing and Christianizing the children. The same year, 1754, King's College was founded in New York. Following the American Resolution, its name was changed to Columbia College. And check out Columbia College now. And in 1787, Constitution signer William Samuel Johnson became Columbia College's first president. Columbia's admission requirements were straightforward. Here they are. No candidate shall be admitted into the college unless he shall be able to render into English the Gospels from the Greek. It is also expected that all students attend public worship on Sundays. So 
I'm going to uh, skip to the last part of it because I'm running out of time. 200, in fact, in that year, and that year being 1766, or actually 1870 as well. So let me say, an examination of other colleges and universities of the day reveals that the examples above, that would be a Columbia and the rest of them, were neither aberrations nor isolated selections. To the contrary, they represent the norm. Here's the norm. Higher education in the United States before 1870 was provided very largely in the tuitional colleges of the different religious denominations rather than by the state. Of the 246 colleges founded by the close of the year 1860, only 17 were state institutions, and but two or three others had any state connections. In fact, in the year, in that year, 1860, 262 of 288 college presidents, 262 of 288 college presidents were ministers of the gospel, as were more than a third of all university faculty members. And in 1890, James Angel, president of the University of Vermont and the University of Michigan, reported that at state universities, over 90% conducted chapel services at half, Chapel attendance was compulsory and a quarter required regular church attendance in addition to chapel attendance. Well, into the 20th century, this remained the practice of state universities, a practice that was simply the continuation of the original John chapter 17, 3 philosophy of education that had caused America to become the most successful and prosperous nation in the history of the world. Ladies and gentlemen, not all change is for the good. And um, I'm not seeing some very good uh, outcomes from changes. I, I, I couldn't have read any of that in the public schools right now. At least in California. At least in California, if I had read that as a history teacher, I probably would have been brought in and, and given a letter of reprimand. Because that would probably seem scandalous to people. Even though it's factual, it's the truth. Then I would ask the kids, you know, how have things changed? I mean, now we have uh, Yale bringing in someone that says the psychopathic mind of the, uh, the white people, whatever the damn title is of that garbage. And we say, how, how has that shown progress? Or are we regressing? You see what I'm saying? We have people hurting each other more so. I feel like every time I wake up now, I'm, I'm seeing somebody getting hit in the face. Okay? And young people hitting old people, black people hitting Asians, you know, whites doing this and that. And I just out of control. If there's anything that I have found with my Christian faith, it, is, it has taught me to find a level of control. Along with my stoicism, I cannot thank Jesus Christ enough for dying on a cross for me. I can't, can't thank enough for my friends that, haven't, that have not left me. My students, my former students, my present students, their families who allow me to be me. At 55 years old, I am not the same teacher I was at 23. Obviously, Yale is not the same university as it was back in 1699. We have made definite progress since 1699. There's no doubt about it. But right now, it feels like we're taking steps back. And I would like everyone to really think about those five words I'm promoting. Respect, responsible, discipline, integrity, and faith. Add those all together and you have love. And you need to start with you and your God. Respect God. Be responsible to God. Have discipline for and with God. Have integrity when you are the same when people are there or not there. Your words and your actions match. Are you perfect? No. Am I perfect? No. That's why we have faith. Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to get through this. This is just another pothole 
on the road to destiny. And that's the title of a book up here somewhere. So I can't thank you enough. Begin with the end in mind. Every choice you make is who you are, so choose wisely. So when we come to your funeral, what do you want to have said? Do it now. Seek first to understand, then be understood. People are hurting. Have you reached out to anybody yet today? And then finally, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. I care about you a lot. That's why on the 8th of June, 2021, I'm doing this. Also, I hope that my grandsons and my granddaughters-to-be are watching this and they're learning something from their grandpa. And um, can I do this for you? And I hope the world hasn't changed as much in the next 20 or 30 years as it's changed in the last, I don't know. And then finally, I'm just doing the best I can, man. I'm doing the best I can. I am doing the best I can. Thanks a lot for your time today. Really appreciate it. Hope you learned something. Go add value to somebody's life. Because when you add value to somebody, you add value to you. Bye.